Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Mishu. Before we dive into this month's episode, as always, I want to say thank you for joining us, and I really hope that you find this podcast helpful. I also want to say that if you are attending the American College of Emergency Physicians Scientific Assembly this year at the end of September, I want you to come find us. I will be at the EB Medicine exhibit and so eager to shake your hand. Thank you for being a listener in person and say hello. So come by, check out all the things that we'll have for you available at the table, and always ebmedicine.net, your one-stop shop for all three journals, emergency medicine practice, pediatric emergency medicine practice, and evidence-based urgent care, and all the courses, including the new DEA course. If you are renewing and you need that eight hours of training, go to ebmedicine.net. It's an emergency medicine-specific training there just for you. And if you're a subscriber, it's free. And if you're not a subscriber, no better time to become one today, but you can also purchase the course separately. And that's it for today. Well, let's jump into this episode on sickle cell disease. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. I am one of your hosts, Sam Mishu, and on the other end of the microphone, T.R. Eckler, back again, reliving my residency days, talking about some very interesting pathology here with sickle cell anemia. That's right. Indeed. We are talking about the emergency medicine practice issue from August of 2024, authored by Dr. Gentry Wilkerson and Dr. Babette Newman on the Emergency Department Management of Sickle Cell Disease, which is a very complex topic. This is yet another one of those issues that is just jam-packed with information. And I like to start in the back of the issue. This is kind of a strange way to approach a topic, but I thought I would point out that there are 110 article citations for this publication. That's 110 different articles, guidelines, reviews from numerous journals, all summarized in this one issue about sickle cell disease that tackles everything in the treatment of sickle cell disease, including some of the inpatient treatment and outpatient treatment that could be relevant when it comes to history and how it's going to affect what you do in the ER. So I think overall, this was a very, very well-written issue and has a ton of information in it. I thought this was very, very similar to the one that we just did on dialysis. The amount of things that I learned and the complexity and the nuance of these patients is incredible. And I thought the authors really did such a thorough review that you could tell that they had looked at everything. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, sickle cell disease is something we might see occasionally in the emergency department. <laughs> if you're listening, you might have seen one or two people. I say that with a whole ton of sarcasm. Clearly, we see sickle cell disease in the emergency department all of the time. In fact, the introduction section of the article mentions that this accounts for more than 200,000 emergency department visits annually, 85% of which are related to pain, you know, moderate to severe pain. So it's a very, very mm. common presentation that we see in the emergency department. And if you're listening and you don't know the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease, there's a great section of that in the issue. It talks about how it's autosomal recessive. It discusses the differences between the sickle cell trait, the types of sickle cell disease. So the ones who are hemoglobin SS are the ones who are going to have the most complications, but there are the ones we will see on occasion who are the mixed hemoglobinopathy, so hemoglobin S and beta thalassemia, which probably have slightly less risk overall and tend to be not quite as anemic, but still have the vaso-occlusive crises and the pain, and we see those commonly as well. We do screening here in the United States for all newborns for sickle cell disease, but I thought the authors did a great job as well at the end of the issue of mentioning that if you're treating someone, adult or child, who might be presenting with something suspicious for a sickle cell crisis without a known history, and they were born overseas, they might not have been screened. Especially relevant, I think, in the pediatric population, and a good point to bring up. I also really like the point that they made that half a million people are born every year with sickle cell disease, and really this trait tends to cluster around the equator. So anyone from South America, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, the Caribbean, Saudi Arabia, India, the Mediterranean countries, any of those populations have the potential to be a sickle cell patient. And I think that this predominantly is seen in the United States in African American patients, but you need to have the open mind that this can be people of many, many different 
descents and backgrounds and national origins. And I think that it's great in the emergency department to have that outlook to then also think about doing the screening or even confirming whether or not for an adult patient that's coming in, what kind of disease they have and then how you can go about treating. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, with travel these days and people going all over the world, it's not really isolated to that belt around the earth anymore. It is diffusely seen throughout the world in all populations. For the patients with sickle cell disease, complications are a very, very important topic, and I think the authors did a great job of addressing each one of them. Unfortunately, it's those complications that give patients with sickle cell disease a shortened life expectancy. In fact, the authors mentioned in the introduction that your average life expectancy for someone with sickle cell disease is 52.6 years, and that's from 2023. You know, when the rest of us are living into our 70s, 80s, and hopefully 90s, most people with sickle cell disease are only expected to make it into their early 50s. That's an alarming statistic, quite surprising. I think that a lot of this was a review for me, having trained in New York City and having seen a lot of sickle cell disease. But I found the stroke point to be one worth making early and often in this. By age 20, 11% of hemoglobin SS, like true sickle cell disease patients, 11% have signs of a stroke by the age of 20, 15% by the age of 30, and 24% by the age of 45. So that has given me a heightened level of concern about stroke in these patients and to be much more cautious in my neuro exam and my history for them about those kind of symptoms to try to really be ahead of that or even think harder about what else I could be doing to support them and to treat that if that's what's going to present in the emergency. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, more than one in 10 of those strokes in children is going to be hemorrhagic. 13% are going to be hemorrhagic. That was surprising to me as well. Absolutely. More concerned about headaches now whenever they present with headaches. That's, it seems like it's a different risk picture than I thought yeah. before. So as far as pathophysiology goes, for people with sickle cell disease, their red blood cells are sickled. That's where the name comes from. It's a deformity of the architecture of the red blood cell, and it comes from a problem with one of the genes that codes for hemoglobin, giving you this deformity in the architecture of the red blood cell. That's nicely explained in the pathophysiology section. This leads to all kinds of vaso-occlusive problems. These sickled red blood cells are less pliable and cause a lot of occlusion, but there's also endothelial dysfunction and inflammation going on and lots of other things that contribute to the vaso-occlusive crises and other complications we see in patients with sickle cell. It's not just an occlusive problem. And interestingly, those red blood cells live only about 15 days. So your typical red blood cell is expected to last 120 days, and a sickled red blood cell is only going to last about 15 days. So they are chronically anemic, they do have a high turnover. Their bone marrow is constantly pushing out more red blood cells because they're losing them at a very high rate, which is one of the problems that causes all of the complications. And speaking of complications, vaso-occlusive crises are at the top of the list. So these account for somewhere from 79 to 91% of emergency department visits that we see. And this presents as pain. And although it's very common, interestingly, there isn't a good definition for what constitutes a vaso-occlusive crisis out there. Our historical understanding was that vaso-occlusive crises begin with some kind of mechanical obstruction somewhere in the capillaries or post-capillary venules, and that is a result of the abnormal sickle shape taken on by the red blood cells, and that triggers a host of then downstream events, things resulting from free heme, hypoxemia, activation of your inflammatory markers and leukocytes and platelets, and then that causes the occlusive crisis to begin. But since then, we've increased our understanding, and it is now also known that patients with sickle cell disease have endothelial dysfunction, hemostatic activation, cellular hyperadhesion, and increased blood viscosity, all of which also play a role in vaso-occlusive crises. So it's not just as simple as a sickled red blood cell causing an obstruction, there's a host of things involved in this cascade, and they're typically triggered by a multitude of factors, things like hypoxia, infection, fever, acidosis, dehydration, pregnancy, alcohol consumption, and physical exhaustion. So that's a host of things that can trigger a sickle cell crisis. One of the things that I think I always struggled with in the emergency department was trying to figure out, okay, well, what caused this crisis? And 
honestly, there are so many underlying things. It seems it's more important to focus on making sure that this crisis wasn't brought on by something life-threatening that I need to address today and making sure that it's just a matter of treating the pain and not that I'm missing something. But those triggers are very important to keep in mind because it helps when you're building your differential for how aggressive do I have to be with hunting down the cause of this vasoocclusive crisis for the patient that's sitting in front of me. Interestingly, poorly controlled comorbid conditions, things like sarcoidosis, diabetes, cholecystitis, and herpes are also known to trigger vasoocclusive crises. So many things can trigger one that it, this is an important list to keep in mind for sure. There has also been some historical controversy about corticosteroid use in vasoocclusive crises. Several studies have suggested that corticosteroids increase the occurrence of vasoocclusive crises, although we don't really understand that mechanism very well. There have been also reports after intraarticular injections of steroids, but not inhaled corticosteroids, which is an interesting finding. Previously, the use of steroids was studied, and there were a couple of randomized trials that showed a beneficial effect on the length of hospital stay when the patient has been admitted for acute chest syndrome and has required transfusions. But then a couple of observational studies showed this rebound effect with an increased rate of hospitalization after having received steroids. And in 2022, there was another case control study of 5,000 patients with sickle cell disease which did show a significant association between steroid use and hospitalization for vasoocclusive crises. Currently, the American Society of Hematology guidelines do not recommend administration of steroids for vasoocclusive crises and actually recommend avoiding steroid use unless there is an appropriate medical condition that would benefit from it. So if you're treating asthma, reactive airway disease, and they need the steroids, they don't want you to shy away from that. Otherwise, it's recommended to try and avoid steroid use in this patient population, which is, again, another important thing to keep in mind. So don't withhold it, and especially it's okay to use inhaled steroids, which I found to be interesting. Splenic sequestration is really something that I have always had in my mind about these patients, but I feel like they did a great job of characterizing it and really specifying how you should be looking for it and be aware of it. It often develops without warning in these patients, and can be fatal in a matter of hours. It's defined by the national organizations as a sudden enlargement of the spleen and reduction in the hemoglobin concentration by at least two grams per deciliter below their baseline level. So establishing with these patients what their baseline is or reviewing from their older records if you have them what their usual hemoglobin is is really important in these patients. And I think that's one of those things that when you see these patients, it should just become a standard of practice for you seeing where their baseline hemoglobin is and seeing if this could be. Yeah, it's such an interesting condition. Like it's the, the, the person who is functionally asplenic, but physically has splenomegaly. It's like you have an enlarged spleen, but you behave and have the physiology of someone who has no spleen at all. It's such an interesting condition. And I think this is something I worry about even more in children, because to your point, as you have less spleen, it's less of a concern, but especially in children when they still have some component of splenic function and and more tissue that's there to then cause more room for, for sequestration to develop. That's really what I took away from this, is that you need to be more fearful of this in the younger children. I think the, the retrospective study they, they talked about found the median age of a first acute sequestration episode was 1.4 years of age, and 75% of cases occur before the age of two. So now this is something that in, you know, my young, very little sickle cell patients, I'm really going to be more cautious about and really be more hesitant to try to let these kids go home if, if it seems like there's a drop in their hemoglobin. Yeah. Yeah. And also interesting, the patients who have the mixed hemoglobinopathy, so they have hemoglobin SC or S beta thal, can still experience splenic sequestration, but typically later in life, which I found fascinating, really. So they still have a rate of somewhere between 7 and 30% splenic sequestration over the course of their lifetime. That's something that can relapse. So it can recur in anywhere from half to two-thirds of the patients that we see. And that's also something to keep in mind, that just because they've had one episode doesn't mean they're not going to have it again. One of the other life-threatening complications, I'd say maybe the worst life-threatening complication, would be acute chest syndrome. And this is abbreviated ACS, but I don't want to confuse it with acute coronary syndrome. So this is acute chest syndrome. They should change this acronym. <laughs> they just need to put some other letter in there because we're all smart doctors that work really hard, but you can't have two ACS. 
The other one is just so Especially big. in the emergency like put an department. S in. Acute sickle chest <laughs> syndrome or acute sickle cell chest syndrome. Like, that'd be better. Like, add a couple more letters, but you got to clarify That's this. Right. You can't overlap with such a giant and expect to get the same kind of attention. So the acute chest syndrome is, is defined as a, an acute illness, which includes fever or respiratory symptoms accompanied by some kind of pulmonary infiltrate on chest x-ray in a patient who has sickle cell disease. And there are criteria for this, which were nicely listed there in table one on page six, which include things like temperature 38.5 or higher, uh, hypoxia with a 2% decrease in their SAT or a PaO2 on blood gas of less than 60, cough, wheezing, or rails, retractions, or nasal flaring, tachypnea, or chest pain, or not and. So any one of these in someone who has sickle cell disease should be suspicious or worrisome for acute chest syndrome. And then there are gradations. So table two nicely details the mild, moderate, severe, and very severe presentations of acute chest syndrome. So this includes everything from they're a little bit hypoxic and they might have maybe one lobe involved to all the way on the other side of the spectrum, ARDS, in someone who is in complete respiratory failure and dying right in front of you. So it's a very huge spectrum, and it is something that is characterized by an abnormality on chest X-ray, which could be pneumonia, could be vaso-occlusive, is something that you're going to treat with antibiotics because it could be pneumonia, but also is someone who you're going to monitor much more closely. So while you may see someone from the community who is otherwise healthy, has a community-acquired lobar pneumonia with some pleuritic irritation, maybe some inhalational pain, you're going to put them on antibiotics, they're otherwise non-toxic appearing, you're doing well, they're going to go home. This is not the case with this population. So the most important thing is not to confound those two cases and to say, okay, this person has sickle cell disease. They have an infiltrate on their chest x-ray. They're talking about chest pain, even though they don't appear sick. And even though they don't have hypoxia, they have chest pain and an infiltrate and they have sickle cell disease. That's a hallmark for acute chest syndrome. And that's somebody you need to watch much more closely and someone who's not going to go home. The overall incidence of this in patients with sickle cell disease is somewhere about 55% of patients who are going to have at least one episode during their lifetime. The peak incidence is still something that is seen in the pediatric population, interestingly, between ages two and four. But there are more cases during that winter months. So you're thinking about your child who comes down with a viral syndrome and then develops a pneumonia or comes down with a viral syndrome and then has complications like this. And that's why it peaks in that pediatric age range. Risk factors for developing it include younger age, uh, hemoglobin SS-specific genotype, low levels of fetal hemoglobin, and higher overall hemoglobin levels. All of those are risk factors for developing acute chest syndrome, and the mortality is about 1% or so overall for children and somewhere between 1% and 4% for adults. So that's not insignificant. You think 1% is 1 in 100 cases is going to die from this illness. And in adults, 4% is even higher. And so something you definitely have to be aware of and keep in the back of your mind when you're seeing someone with an abnormal X-ray who has sickle cell disease. So moving on from acute chest, which I think is one of the, the more dangerous and kind of things that we're always thinking about in our sickle cell disease patients, priapism is a more common problem that's going to present in these patients and is not as life-threatening, but can still you know, lead to significant morbidity scarring and damage for the patient. And I think it's more challenging for them to want to always explain that to you or definitely, you know, clearly describe their symptoms and what's going on. And I think they're going to wait longer to seek treatment for this because they're going to try to, you know, see if it'll calm down on its own. They're going to try their home pain medication. But I think this is something in the emergency room where if you really can be clear and know what you need to do to treat this, you can make a big difference on this and you can resolve these quickly. I tend to use a small butterfly needle when I treat these, Sam, because then I can leave a line basically there and I can drain and then I can flush and inject medicine. And I'm only, you know, basically piercing one time into a very sensitive area to stick a needle. What do you tend to do in your practice? Yeah, I think if you can use a butterfly needle and it's not getting clogged and you can aspirate enough out of that cavernosum, then you're doing well. If you start with a butterfly and it's not working, you're probably going to have to progress to something larger. And all of that is really dependent on how adequate your block is. So if you can get the nerve block in your, your gap adequate analgesia, then you can move forward with really any kind of needle in that scenario. There have been described in the past, you know, you're either pulling out 
clotted blood and trying to infuse saline and trying to dilute what's in there. And I think the literature now really recommends just aspiration. So I think if you're successful in aspiration, then you're doing well. And it all starts with adequate pain control. Uh, but you're absolutely right. These people definitely present late. And you know sometimes it's an embarrassing problem they don't want to go seek health care for. It is broken down into two categories. So you've got the ischemic priapism, which is the vast majority, like 95% of these and the non-ischemic or the high-flow type of priapism. And the way to tell the difference is actually to perform an arterial blood gas on the sample as soon as you aspirate it. If you have one of those bedside ABG machines, you can do that. And if there's a uh, acidosis present, a significant acidosis, then that tells you that this is a low-flow ischemic process and aspiration is safe. The, the differentiator there being that if it's a high-flow, non-ischemic priapism, you really need your urologist involved because simple aspiration isn't going to do anything for this patient. <laughs> it's going to keep That's coming. Right. <laughs> That's not going to work. Yeah, I think, I mean, 32 to 42% of sickle cell disease patients are going to experience this, those being males, obviously. And 74% of men with sickle cell disease who experience priapism will have a recurrence. And that's been my experience clinically that, you know, these people get it and, and it tends to come back. And it tends to be a great patient population to stop and ask, hey, what has worked for you in the past to treat this? Do you know what they've done to treat it? You know, and that can often guide you to the right way. But it's good to know kind of how to escalate your care for these patients and to try to do it quickly because they've probably been waiting for a few hours, hoping it was going to resolve on its own. Yeah, and if you're wondering why sickle cell patients get priapisms, it, it's really, again, not just about occlusion. There is a nitric oxide metabolism pathway that is dysregulated in sickle cell disease patients. Specifically, that's nitric oxide to cyclic GMP to protein kinase G, and then finally phosphodiesterase type 5, which is going to hydrolyze your cyclic GMP and lead to the detumescence. And so the patients who have sickle cell disease have decreased levels of this phosphodiesterase type 5, which results in priapism. And it's a specific deficiency that they have, and it's not just an occlusive issue. All right, next on the list is stroke. Now, we mentioned this already when it talked about the epidemiology, but stroke is certainly, unfortunately, a common problem in sickle cell disease. It presents just like it does with any other patient with sudden onset of some kind of aphasia or weakness, sometimes seizures or coma, and it can lead, obviously, to severe motor and cognitive deficits. The incidence of this is somewhere around 11% by age 20, like you said, and then increases up to 24% by age 45. And as we mentioned already, 13% of these are going to be hemorrhagic strokes, which was an alarming number. And in addition to the overt strokes, about 35% of these are going to be silent. They'll just be getting neuroimaging for some other problem. And then on that imaging, there will be evidence that they've had prior strokes. The 13% hemorrhagic stroke, though, is in children. That does not apply to adult patients. So it's something to be more fearful of in children, but that's not a number that, that we're worried about as much in our adult patients. Yeah, excellent point. Excellent point. In the adult population, when the stroke occurs, their mechanism is thought to be the same. So it's the thromboembolic mechanisms, just like it is in the general population. In the pediatric population, the mechanism is thought to be related to abnormal cell adhesion and intravascular sickling, and so treatment guidelines are vastly different. In the adult, 18 and over, you're still eligible for thrombolytics, and you're going to go down that normal evaluation process. In the pediatric population, treatment is very different. We'll get into that in just a little bit, but it does not include thrombolytics in the normal process. But I think this has made me and more in our stroke patients that come in as like stroke alerts to your hospital, you know, pre-hospital EMS is activating and you've got a stroke patient coming in. I'm going to stop and ask now about sickle cell history in these patients because it's going to slightly change my approach and it's going to make me be a little more cautious as I'm kind of going through this and trying to calculate that risk and benefit for TPA or whatnot for each patient. Yeah. Yeah, and interestingly, TIAs or transient ischemic attacks often precede this both in children and adults. So if they have a history of TIA and then develop sudden changes, that's even more worrisome that they're having an acute stroke. And then lastly is infectious complications. So patients with sickle cell disease are getting IVs. Frequently, they're having lines placed. They, they might have outpatient indwelling lines that they're walking around with. They're also functionally asplenic, and they're at high risk for infections. And so infectious complications are unfortunately very common, especially with organisms that are encapsulated because of their splenic dysfunction. And so patients up until the age of five are given prophylactic penicillin, which has resulted in a large decrease in sepsis and complications of strep pneumonia bacteremia in this age population. 
prophylactic penicillin was shown to reduce the risk of pneumococcal infection in patients with both sickle SS disease and sickle fowl disease. Also, interestingly, in this section was a discussion about COVID. You know, patients who have sickle cell disease and then contract COVID are also at increased risk for complications, and it is recommended that they get vaccinated for COVID in order to prevent those complications. And in the pediatric population, because of the prophylaxis with penicillin, the organisms now that frequently result in presentation to the ER and hospitalization include things like salmonella, which is interesting because it's not pneumococcus anymore because they're on the penicillin. Now they're getting food poisoning. They're still at risk for other things like Staph aureus, of course, and skin-related bacteria, especially if they have indwelling lines. So lots of things to keep in mind when it comes to infectious causes. And don't forget that these infectious causes not only are a problem by themselves, but can then lead to other complications like the acute chest syndrome or the stroke. And so early treatment is important for sure. When it comes to how we approach these cases in the emergency department, we start with pre-hospital care. If you're in the pre-hospital setting, there isn't any good evidence for anything specific or different that you need to do in this population other than to keep in mind a few caveats. You're going to avoid giving oxygen supplementation unless they're obviously hypoxic or in respiratory distress. Hyperoxia is not beneficial in these patients. Obtaining IV access is helpful. Administering crystalloid infusion can be helpful, especially if they're hypotensive or they're obviously dehydrated, like they have skin tinting or dry mucous membranes. But overall, we're trying to reduce how much fluid we give these patients in total. So if they're not hypotensive or obviously dehydrated, there's no reason to start the fluid. You can start the IV because you've got to treat them for pain, which is highly recommended, but you definitely don't have to start the fluid bolus unless you have a reason to do it. And then when they get to the emergency department, there's our history. In the history, we're going to ask a lot of questions, but the most important things you want to keep in mind are what was the onset of the pain and you know, how rapid was it? What's the location of the pain and how long has it been there? And is this typical for you, especially in the adult population where they're able to convey this information? It's very helpful to know, oh, this is a typical vaso-occlusive crisis or no, this is different. I don't usually have pain in my hip. I usually get it in my lower back. And so that's a very important distinction you need to make, especially because it will help drive your differential to other things that may be causing the symptoms. You also want to know about, of course, what makes it better, where does the pain radiate, what's the timing and the severity, what have they taken to help with the pain. So if most of our patients who are adults have access to home opioids and you want to know, hey, I've taken my oxycodone, I've taken my oxycontin, I've done my usual protocol and the pain is still escalating and I talked to my hematologist and they said, come in. And that's a pretty common history that we will hear. When it comes to physical examination, just a head-to-toe exam, don't forget you're looking for anything else that might have triggered their sickle cell crisis, and so you want to see their skin. You need to look and make sure they don't have a cellulitis. You need to make sure that they don't have a hot, red, swollen joint in the area where they're complaining of pain, especially if this is a new symptom and one they've never had before. Signs of shingles, signs of disseminated zoster, as you said, with herpetic infections being a common cause. And also looking for jaundice in these patients, like trying to see if they're having a sequestration crisis or if they're having a hem hemolytic crisis, like exactly how bad are things for them now? And, and then asking them what their baseline is. Do they have a baseline amount of jaundice or is this new and, and different? To your point, like the, the big changes and the things that are different for them are going to really help you understand who are the patients that need more help and more support. Yeah, and I can see it now. You know, I saw them in triage in a chair in the corner where the light was off and there's poor lighting and you know, I couldn't get them undressed and I couldn't examine the joint and I couldn't get a very good skin exam. And you know, there's all kinds of reasons why this can go poorly. Just make sure in this population you're spending that extra time pulling out your little pocket flashlight, looking at their eyes, examining the area that hurts for sure. Laboratory studies. So everybody gets labs. <laughs> Everybody's getting a CBC, a CMPN or a tick count at baseline. Just know that there is a population of patients described in the literature where labs are not necessary. It seems hard to believe in the emergency department that this might be the population. But if you know someone well or if the person has an exceptionally reliable history and this is a typical exacerbation, you don't have to get the labs. Now, we get the labs we're looking for. The important things are hemoglobin level, so making sure it's at baseline and not more than two grams per deciliter below that baseline or making sure it's not less than six if you don't know their baseline. And then looking to make sure that their kidney function is normal. Uh, you can check liver functions. It's usually included in that complete metabolic profile. And then looking at their retic count. 
I actually remember having a conversation with a hematologist many years ago where he was criticizing the emergency department for always getting a retic count. He goes, you guys always get the retic count. I don't understand why you get the retic count. And I said, well, I mean, you're the hematologist. You know why we're getting the retic count, right? I just yeah, got to make sure they're not having an aplastic crisis. And he just laughed. He goes, they're not having an aplastic crisis. This is ridiculous. And I said, okay, well, I mean, I'm no hematologist, but as an emergency medicine physician, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> And so it was a very interesting conversation, but we get the retic count. And honestly, the retic count is going to be elevated in your sickle disease patient. This person is churning out more reticulocytes than normal. And so their reticulocyte count is going to be higher at baseline, like 4 to 15% at baseline. If it's normal to low, that would be concerning, especially if the person is anemic and having symptoms of a crisis. That's where you start to think, okay, this person is having an aplastic crisis, or at least I'm worried about it. I need to consult with their hematologist. So that's the reason why we get that reticulous like count. There are many other labs that you can order. Uh, procalcitonin can be helpful maybe in differentiating between the bacterial and viral causes of fever, just like it would be in any other non-sickle patient, so not specific to sickle cell disease. The ESR, so erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and CRP have not been found to be useful in patients presenting with the infectious complications of sickle cell disease. So you don't really have to worry about that. But if they do have signs of acute hemolysis, like they're jaundice or they have scleral icterus, then a lactate dehydrogenase is going to be helpful, especially for your inpatient colleagues. Fractionated bilirubin is going to be helpful for your inpatient colleagues. One more reason to get that CMP, you can get the baseline liver functions and a total bilirubin as well. And then we're on to treatment. So that's the extent of the labs that you're going to need in the emergency department. And again, most of this is usually protocolized. As soon as the IV goes in, the blood is being sent you should have some kind of baseline to compare this to in your patient. So if they've been to the emergency department before, you can look that up. You'll know what their baseline hemoglobin was when they left the hospital last time and hopefully have something to compare it to. I think it's worth talking about imaging before we move on to treatment because I do think there's some simple rules that you need to kind of keep in your head when it comes to patients with sickle cell disease. Any patient with pain that's kind of unilateral that could be due to an acute vasoclusive crisis and no evidence of trauma and low evidence or low suspicion for avascular necrosis or osteomyelitis doesn't need imaging. But if they're saying they have chest pain, if they're saying they have shortness of breath, that patient's going to need a chest x-ray. If you've got patients that have unilateral pain to their hip or their shoulders or their joints that's new and different from their prior experiences and their prior crises, then that's something where you want to pursue that more and get imaging. You need to think now more about neuroimaging in these patients. If there's any kind of stroke-like symptoms, neurologic deficits, that needs to be someone that you're more quickly and more expeditiously getting a scan on or someone that's got a headache that's new and different than their usual headaches. And then lastly, patients with abdominal pain, flank pain, that may push you to either a right upper quadrant ultrasound or a CT of the abdomen pelvis depending on what you're more concerned about at the time. And you may end up needing both depending on kind of the picture that the patient gives you. But I think that being ready to go looking for hepatic sequestration, splenic sequestration, splenic or renal infarction, or acute intrahepatic cholestasis is something that you need to have in that approach to these patients with imaging to understand that there can be value in imaging the right patients that come in in, in their crises because they can have further sequelae and further complications. Absolutely. All right. And then when it comes to treatment, step number one is treat the pain. And this is very interesting because I feel as though we're having the same conversations we have had for really the 20 plus years of my attending career that we had when I first started. It's always the question of, well, how much am I going to give this person? How do I assess their pain? And how do I know if they're malingering? And honestly, the reason why the malingering or pain-seeking or opioid-abusing question comes up is because of their frequency of access to healthcare. But we know that our sickle cell disease patients have an increased need to access healthcare, and they're in the emergency department more often than anyone else for vasoocclusive crises, which are very common. They're going to be there a lot. They're on home opioids already. They are trying to manage at home in most cases and failing, and that's the reason for presentation. And so the question is going to come up in the back of your mind, and there are some things to guide that answer. Number one, you can't really assess someone's pain level in a vasoocclusive crisis as you would someone who, say, fractured their tibia or their fibula or fell off a motorcycle or has just been hit by a car. That, you know, you, you can tell when someone has an open fracture and they're writhing around, okay, this person's in a lot of pain. 
or I can tell when someone's diaphoretic and nauseated that they're passing a kidney stone. I go, this person's in a lot of pain. The vasoclusive crisis is difficult, right? The pain can actually make you vagal. It can may not present with tachycardia. Their blood pressure may be normal. And the person who is experiencing chronic recurrent waves of severe pain with multiple vasoocclusive crises over time has developed a skill set to try and manage that pain, including things like distraction. They may not be engaging with you. They may be looking at their phone. They may have headphones on. They may be doing their best to distract themselves from the severity of their pain, which is not your typical pain patient like someone who just broke their leg. They don't want to look at their phone. They don't want a pair of headphones. They're not interested in that. They sure. want immediate opioid treatment. So it can be very difficult to assess pain, and you have to take the patient's word for it. You got to ask them on the pain scale. That's been proven to be effective. What's your pain? What have you taken? Where are we? If you have old records, it can be very helpful to see what they responded to in the past and how much they required. I would say in my practice, I have seen patients who receive four milligrams of morphine per dose and patients who receive four milligrams of hydromorphone per dose anywhere along that spectrum. Patients who get fentanyl, patients who get ketamine, patients whose normal treatment just includes ketorolac and IV fluids. So it's very helpful to have old records. You know how opioid tolerant or opioid naive the person is who's sitting in front of you. And then it's okay to have this conversation with the patient. Hey, how bad is your pain? Let's get pain medicine started immediately. They don't obviously bleeding. They don't obviously have a fracture. And that unfortunately results in delay of care in a lot of places that are busy. So they may not be a priority, but the American Society for Hematology recommends making them a triage level two, an acuity two patient. And they ought to get their pain medicine in 60 minutes or less, which seems impossible in some emergency departments. I know, but I'm just telling you, those guidelines are out there. They need their pain medication. And where you start on that spectrum for pain medicine is just very dependent on what you know about their history, how much information you have, and what they've taken already. So don't be afraid to begin pain therapy. I thought the authors did a good job of discussing different options you have. There are suggested parenteral opioid doses in Table 3 for adults. Uh, that's anyone really age over 12 who's 50 kilos or more. Uh, table 4 is suggested dosing for children. That's fentanyl, morphine, and hydromorphone. Table five is suggested PCA dosing for adults. And table six is suggested PCA or patient-controlled analgesia dosing for children. So you've got some referenced guidelines for how much to give, where to start, and how often to give uh, as far as frequency of dosing. But they also did a good job of discussing some of the problems you might encounter. For example, opioid side effects. Itching is a very, very common one. And we have developed a habit of, well, we put an IV in, and so everything must go in the IV for this person. And that's not actually beneficial in this case. If you're treating them with IV opioids and they develop itching or pruritus, then you're going to treat it with diphenhydramine. The recommended treatment is oral diphenhydramine, 25 milligrams and that's repeated every four to six hours. So we're not giving 50 or 75 milligrams. We're not giving it IV because administration of diphenhydramine IV comes with significant sedation. And so does the opioid you're giving them. And you don't need that excessive sedation. Nausea is also another one of the most common side effects we see from opioids. And so you don't have to combine an antiemetic with your opioid, especially if they're opioid tolerant. Most people don't have that issue. But if they are complaining of nausea, using something that's non-sedating is important. So ondansetron is a good choice. There is a recommendation there to avoid prochlorperazine and metoclopramide because they can worsen sedation. So unless they absolutely have an allergy to something that's non-sedating, using something that's non-sedating is important. So oral diphenhydramine, nausea medication that's non-sedating, and then having some naloxone nearby is important because you're going to get some opioid medication stacking, especially early on, in order to try and get some pain control. And frequency of dosing is really a spectrum. And I will say, to the credit of the authors, they did a good job of saying, you know, you're going to go in there, you're going to give a dose, you're going to wait 10 to 15, 20 minutes, give another dose, and wait 10 to 15 minutes and give another dose, because in general, that analgesia effect is going to occur in that 10 to 15 minute window, depending on which agent you're giving. And I will say also that clinical practice has made that challenging for a multitude of reasons. Number one, the emergency department is busy and assessing someone every 15 to 20 minutes, even just by the nurse, seems like it's an impossibility. 
But this is one case where that should be a priority because this is the only reason that they're there is to get that adequate pain control. And if they're hemodynamically normal and they're going to go home, uh, getting control of that pain early might actually get them home sooner. Second, it can be challenging because they're going to get sedated. And stacking pain meds quickly in order to try and rapidly achieve pain control, especially in someone who is maybe on the nurse. Can I have another dose? I need another dose now. I need another dose now. Well, we just gave you one, you know, two minutes ago, and you're not due for another one in 15 minutes. Well, no, I need another dose right now. And, you know, sometimes we get we to the point where we want to cut some corners. Well, I don't have time to keep coming back in here. I'm just going to give you the second dose early. And this is where we can get some problems or we can run into some trouble because we can stack doses. We might have to give some naloxone. Having it on hand is very important. 0.4 milligrams of IV naloxone is enough to alleviate sedation without reversing the analgesia. So small doses, just enough to wake them up, get them breathing again, and then put them on the monitor. Make sure they have, especially if they have sedation, make sure that they have their end tidal CO2 on so that you can watch them closely in the ED. It's a spectrum. And TR, I'm sure you've experienced this before in the ED. I think if you don't see as many patients with sickle cell disease, you can get exposed to the patients that do seem like they're coming in to try to get as much pain medicine as they can, get a prescription, get something else. But I think that you've got to approach each of these experiences as, okay, is there real pathology? Is there something that I can do to help this patient? Is there more that I can do to figure things out? And then when it comes to pain control, my takeaway from this section was really Tylenol is not recommended by the hematology society. You know, IV type, ibuprofen, you know, Toradol can help some people, but isn't something that they're strongly recommending either. And IV fluids, which I kind of thought there was value in all those things. There really is not as much value as I thought. And therefore, I think, especially for patients that I trust, I think patients that are being honest and being reasonable, I'm more inclined now from this to give them, like, to focus more on my opiate treatment first. If I can't get an IV in them, I think one thing that they left out of this is it isn't always easy to get an IV in these patients. And I think that you should not wait for pain control to get an IV. I think having a first dose of intramuscular or an oral dose of something opiate, if they haven't had anything all day, is something that should really be considered as let's start to get this patient more comfortable. Then let's figure out the IV. Then let's figure out kind of what we're going to do next. And then to your point, I think there's such a range in terms of what they are going to get relief from in their doses. And if you look at the hospital and they were in the hospital, you know, two, three, four milligrams of hydromorphone in order to control their pain, you need to have that in your mind that you need to at least try to land where they're going to need for that pain control. And then for reliable patients that are really trying to get their pain under control and go home, that is someone that I'm going to think about ketamine for. I don't think it's for every patient with sickle cell, but I do think it's for the patients that are either in really severe pain that are coming in or the really, you know, patients that are in a lot of pain but are really trying to get home. I'm going to put that in my head more as that might be something that I want to think about to try to get things under control for them. And I will say that I know you're one of these physicians as well, but during my career, I became one of the people that sickle cell patients would ask for. And I will tell you, I did look at my utilization of opioids in this patient population, and it was not higher than most. It was not higher statistically than the group average. The only difference, in my opinion, was that I was willing to have that conversation and I was respectful when I was having that conversation. So it just speaks volumes when the patient thinks you're walking in the room, you're addressing them you know, cordially, you're having that conversation of where is your pain, is this similar to your prior pain, and how much have you taken, and this is what I saw in the past has worked, this is where we're going to start, it's okay to have that conversation. And it's okay to just treat them with a little bit of respect. This patient population is very sensitive because they've been to the ER 100,000 times and they've been ignored 100,000 times and they've had to wait for their pain meds hours and hours and hours in the past and maybe even on the day that you see them. And so it's important to just check your own self, take some deep breaths at the door before you walk in and just, and then start this kind of afresh with the patient and just go, I know you're here for this. Let's talk about that pain. What have you taken? This is where we started before. And I think it's totally okay to say, I'm going to plan to give you two or three doses. You know, I'm going to give you three doses over the next hour or two. Or our protocol is to give X doses of X milligrams of this medication for you over the next time period. And then I'm going to come back in here and we're going to talk. And if you're still having severe pain, my recommendation is to put you in the hospital at that point. 
it's totally okay to say all of that up front. And if you come back to the patient and say, okay, we've, you've had your requisite three doses and your pain is 10 out of 10, we must put you in the hospital. And they say, I just want one more dose and then I don't want to be here. I completely understand that. I, I don't want to be in the hospital once a month, every month either. It's just inconvenient for your life, but also it's, it's uncomfortable. You have people waking you up at all hours. There's numerous reasons why you don't want to be in the hospital. And you may get to the point where they can handle their pain at home. And if that's the case, you know, one more dose it is. That's okay. Having a pain management protocol for this patient established by their hematologist is exceptionally helpful. We struggled with that for many, many years, but there are some centers that do this very, very well. And for anybody who has any kind of chronic pain, it's immediately, here's your plan, and this is what we agree, and you're going to sign this, and I'm going to sign this, and this is what you're going to have in the future when you come here. And that's okay. If you have one of those established, great. If you don't, maybe talk about it. Having some kind of established ED protocol for how you approach these patients and having your hematologist sign off on it. Like, you know, if you're opiate naive, we're giving this. If you're opiate tolerant, we're giving this. And if you're opiate you know, very tolerant and you're on high-dose opiates at home, we're giving this. So you're in the ABC category low, middle, medium, or high category, and this is how we progress. And it's understood that I'm going to call you hematologist if we reach X doses. And that would be so easy to plan ahead of time and save you a lot of trouble when you're in the emergency department. And I, I think to your point, like going the, an extra step when you have the opportunity in, in these patients to call their hematologist or reach out to the office and see, can they get in? Can they get into like their infusion center? Can they get fluids or pain control? by going over there? Can they go get their protocol therapy, not in the emergency room where, you know, the sick people are, but can they go over and in a more, you know, what I think safe and controlled setting, you know, receive the pain control and the care that they need? A lot of times these patients will have already reached out and either can't get there for one reason or another, or there's not enough space. But I think it's important to know if that resource exists for these patients and whether or not they're utilizing it. And also to see if they're really following up and getting their care if they're not, because you can start to encourage them that there's things that can be done, there's medications that can help control their symptoms, and they need to try to get back to that care. Like the emergency department isn't a place that's going to make this less frequent for them. We're only really just treating the exacerbations, but we're not going to make them better. Yeah, well said. IV fluids you already mentioned, but really the recommendation for IV fluids used to be you're sickling, you're having a crisis, here's your pain meds, here's your NSAID, here's your IV fluid bolus for everybody every time. And that's not the recommendation anymore. In fact, research has shown that excessive IV fluids will give you things like hyperchloremic acidosis, which can actually trigger a vaso-occlusive crisis if you don't have one, and worsen one if you are having one. We're not giving you the IV fluids as boluses if you want to put them on some maintenance fluids because they're not taking anything orally. That's fine. Otherwise, oral hydration is perfectly acceptable. They don't have to have IV fluids running and they only need it if there's evidence for dehydration or acute kidney injury or something of that sort. Treatment for priapism, we started this uh, a little earlier, but you can get uh, a small amount of blood aspirated, stick it in your blood gas analyzer. If the pH is less than 7.2, that tells you it's ischemic and it's okay to proceed with aspiration. That's going to be, like I said, the vast majority of cases, like 95% or more of the cases. And as you aspirate, then you're going to also use phenylephrine, which is a selective alpha-1 receptor agonist, to try and achieve detumescence. That is diluted in normal saline. You're going to try and achieve a concentration of 100 to 500 micrograms per milliliter. Most of my urology colleagues have maximized this concentration. They love the 500 microgram per ml. And you're going to give it in one milliliter injections every three to five minutes directly into the corpus cavernosum. Now, the guideline there says no more than 1,000 micrograms should be administered over an hour, and that's our practice. What the urologist does is something completely different, but that's okay because they're the ones who have to fix the complications. And as long as you're not the one who has to fix the complication, you must follow the guideline. So there it is, up to 1,000 micrograms in an hour, and most of the time that works. If they have relapsing priapism, that's a very common scenario. Some people have had treatment for priapism in the emergency department multiple times, and you will know them. I do think that for these patients, aspiration, then irrigation, then the phenylephrine honestly works the best because I think trying to put phenylephrine into an area with clots and, you know, more sluggish blood flow, it doesn't get where you really want it to. It doesn't get everywhere and it's not as effective. Whereas I do feel like if you irrigate the patients that I've treated, it's significantly more effective if you clear out more space for that medicine to then work. Yeah, that's a great point. And also, if you're unsuccessful, maybe your urologist is unsuccessful, there is a role for exchange transfusion in these patients. 
And a word, actually, about transfusions. A standard transfusion is we're giving somebody red blood cells. An exchange transfusion is we're taking away their red blood cells and then giving them red blood cells. And that, in sickle cell disease, comes with a couple of advantages. One, it's removing the sickled red blood cells and providing normal red blood cells, meaning they have alpha hemoglobin. And two, it is also preventing the iron overload they're going to get from massive transfusions and hopefully improving their viscosity all at the same time. Exchange transfusion is indicated in a few different scenarios, and we'll mention that as we go along, but that's what that means. Treatment for acute chest syndrome, again, depending on the spectrum, how severe is this case, it's definitely going to encompass antibiotics. You're going to treat them for community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, so your typical things like strep pneumonia, but also staph aureus, and keep in mind that they are still susceptible to mycoplasma and chlamydia and pneumonia as well. And then you're going to do your supportive care. If they're hypoxic, you're going to supplement with oxygen. You're not going to supplement with oxygen if they're not hypoxic. It's an important differentiator. And then in the pediatric population, it's the same. So the same antibiotic regimens. You're still looking at things like ceftriaxone and azithromycin and supportive care. Just keep in mind that if they're ill-appearing, this is usually someone who's going to like intermediate care, ICU setting. And if they're well appearing, they can still be on the floor, but someone who's not going to go home. Further treatment for the really sick acute chest syndrome cases does include transfusions. And again, exchange transfusion is something that has been shown to be beneficial in this population. There is a table on page 13, recommendations for acute transfusion in sickle cell disease patients that lists acute chest syndrome with severe anemia versus acute chest syndrome with severe features. So you go back to that table, are they mild, medium, high risk, and so on? How severe is this exacerbation? And there may be an indication there for an exchange transfusion, depending on how ill they are. That's usually occurring in your ICU. Those patients tend to have longer lengths of stay, but that's not surprising. They're also more ill and requiring more intense services. When you're looking at seeing these patients in more rural critical access hospitals, this is a great kind of question to consider when you look at a sick sickle cell patient with acute chest or with a stroke or with hepatic sequestration or splenic sequestration. Do they have the resources that I need at the place that I'm going to try to transfer this person to? So do they have ICU capability for adults or children? Do they have the ability to do an exchange transfusion, and do they have the ability to manage the stroke or the acute chest syndrome in this kind of a patient? And I think that's a great thing to talk about with your transferring center to make sure that you're landing a sick patient like this somewhere that they're going to have the things that they need, because this was eye-opening to me in terms of the benefits of exchange transfusion, specifically in the acute chest patient, the stroke patient, or those sicker sequestration patients, and that it makes a lot of sense now that I've understood it but I think it means a lot for when you're going to transfer someone like this to make sure they land somewhere where that's a capability. Yes, and actually, for patients who have stroke confirmed on neuroimaging, the guidelines do recommend urgent exchange transfusion as well as initiation of a program of monthly simple or exchange transfusions for secondary prevention. And so this is something that is known to your hematologists, making sure that they're aware of what's going on with the patient. They'll be happy to guide you through what comes next. If you're dealing with someone who has a stroke, again, and they're an adult, remember that they are a candidate for and that they are at higher risk for hemorrhage if they're in the pediatric population, so at 13% risk. Lastly, some special populations, specifically pregnant patients. So pregnant patients are definitely at increased risk, six-fold higher risk for maternal death than other patients, higher rates of preeclampsia and eclampsia, preterm labor, sepsis, DVT, cerebral venous thrombosis, and urinary tract infections. So clearly at higher risk, typically will be followed by somebody from maternal fetal medicine who knows them very well. So getting a hold of that person is also very helpful if they're presenting to your emergency department. Just know that they are certainly at higher risk. And then just as a summary, a couple of things to keep in mind for your patients with sickle cell disease. You don't have to give them the IV fluid boluses. Just use it when needed. You shouldn't place them on oxygen unless they're hypoxic. Exchange transfusion can certainly be indicated, so take a look at that table and the severity of their exacerbation and know the indications because that may result in a transfer as opposed to just a simple transfusion for your patient. And for adult patients who are presenting with stroke who are in that four-and-a-half-hour window, they're still candidates for thrombolysis. 
the sickle cell disease in that scenario is not going to change your initial ED evaluation in adults. But in pediatric patients, it is not recommended. That's an indication for transfer if you don't have the facilities and exchange transfusion. And lastly, patients who present with acute chest syndrome should be monitored, and things that predict severity would be worsening hypoxia, increasing respiratory rate, decreasing hemoglobin concentration, multi-lobar involvement, or neurological decline. All of those would be hallmarks you have to keep in mind and be monitoring for because that is telling you that this person's headed down the wrong direction. And that's it. Again, thank you to Dr. Newman and Dr. Wilkerson for authoring this excellent issue. This was the August 2024 emergency medicine practice issue on the ED evaluation of patients with sickle cell disease, both adult and pediatric. And until next time, I'm Sam Mishu. Tierra Claire. Excited to have another chance to talk about such an interesting patient population that we see on a regular basis. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Bye-bye now. And that's a wrap for this month's episode. Thank you for joining TR and I. I hope you found it educational and informative. Don't forget to go to ebmedicine.net to read the article and claim your CME. And of course, check out all three of the journals and the multitude of resources available to you, both for emergency medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, and evidence-based urgent care. Until next time, everyone, be safe.